Hey everyone, hope you guys enjoy our talk today with Olivier Gruder, a former French commando, Marine, world kickboxing champion, actor, helicopter pilot, and a instructor for tactics. Hope you guys enjoy. So uh, great to talk to you finally, Olivier. Uh, it's uh, Now you are in Vegas, right? Yeah, I'm in Vegas today, and the reason is because, uh, of course, the gun law, you know, um, there's things that we can have here that we cannot have in California, and you have to be extremely careful because the law changes all the time. So for the audience also, they have to know from, uh, it's not because you're in Vegas that you can get, carry your gun anywhere. You can't. They sell in uh, northern Las Vegas. is a little bit different. So you got to really check the law, even if you are in Nevada, okay? So it's kind right. of a, but if you are here, at least you know you're okay. So I'll kind of step back a little bit here. Um, yeah. What led to your military career? Was there any upbringing? Now, you're, I guess your father was a doctor and your brother was an engineer? Yep. So what kind of led you down the career path of the military? Well, <sighs> You know, I think I had that inside of me. It's not like uh, since I was a kid, you know, you, um, I don't know. It was unbred. I was fascinated about going into the armed forces. I wanted to become a legionnaire. Uh, <clears throat> but my dad was really, he loves diving. So he's a diver. And he told me the only way I'm going to let you go is that, and I prove I mean, after I'm 18, I can do whatever I want, but it's not right. good to do that to their parents, you know? So I want to make sure you approve, right? So he said, if you go to the SEALs, the equivalent of the Navy SEAL in France, I'd be okay with that. So so the first thing I did is I spent, uh, when I was still in high school, so I was 17 years old, I got uh, involved with paratroopers. And um, so it's kind of a preparation, a military pre preparation. So we got a couple of jumps. So we got, you know, the wings. And uh, that was interesting. You know, it was, uh, it was pretty cool. I mean, it was like a, kind of a, the explorer program that you have here for the police department. Is, um, right. You know, this is very regimented. And uh, it's, a good, it's a good way to get in. And then uh, with my mom, because uh, <clears throat> I was not 18, after I finished high school, um, she took me to the um, in Paris, and there was like recruitment for the Navy, and I went there, and uh, she signed, and my dad signed, and a uh, couple months later, I was in. That's awesome. <laughs> and what was the training like for making that team you're on, the commando team? You know, it, it, it's I got to tell you, you have a lot of shows on YouTube you can watch, and how intense it is. But the first thing is, you join the Navy. Okay. So you're going to be a Navy guy first. So you learn everything about the water, about navigation, about uh, guns, of course, uh, lower level, you know. And then uh, they teach you how to sail, you know. So that was really interesting. It was pretty cool. And that takes, I think it was two or three months of, uh, of training. And then when you get graduated from there, you, they choose. You don't choose. They tell you where to go. <laughs> I mean, you make your, uh, you know, you say, well, I want to be, right. I want to go this route. And they tell you, you can or you can't, you know. And of course, uh, I got, uh, they, they told me I was okay. So I went to the, it's called the Fusier Marin. It's kind of a little bit like the equivalent of the of the Marines. Okay. You know, we just, uh, uh, Fusier Marin is more like uh, uh, guys who will land on the beach and, uh, you know, like the Marines, what they did right. in uh, 44, which I have a lot of respect for them, just to let you know. Marines, paratroopers, and all these guys. You guys are awesome. Um, and then after that, uh, so we spent six months doing that. And then if you get graduated from that, which is pretty intense at this point, then you get accepted to the commando, commando Mar Marine, it's called. And that's the equivalent of... Uh, uh, the Navy SEAL. So now you go, it's only two months. It's extremely intense. It's like we have Hell Week at the end. Right. Also as well. <clears throat> so we do some stuff like 
uh, I can't tell you everything, but example, just an example. Uh, one of the tough thing was um, to be inside a, uh, a dark room. You have a short on and you're tied up and you got to escape. And you're going to find your way out. So you have to untie yourself and try to find your way out. And you touch things. And if there is water and there's a hole, you maybe you're going to dive down, but you don't know if there's an exit. So yes. That's pretty intense, right? Right. Um, so you should not be afraid of being claustrophobic because that's uh, a big thing. Um, you have time. You also, But the thing that most of the guys would remember is cold. Cold. That's how I remember. Cold, 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 cold. <laughs> and uh, of course, we don't get we don't get fed a lot, so you lose a lot of weight. And um, another exercise we had is um, they put a bunch of guns and they tear them apart, blindfolded, and you have five minutes to put them back together without Man. you know we're looking at it. But it's really excellent training. I mean. They put you, uh, I remember one, one time uh, they put us in a river with my buddy and we are tied up, right? And they tell you uh, one mile up the river, right? You're done. <laughs> so we're like, oh yeah, we're going to be done. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, half an hour would be done. Well, six hours later. <laughs> You see the tree was here. It was still right on my right side. And people are having cramps. So a lot of guys, you know, they couldn't finish it. So we, I finished it with, uh, with, my, with my guy, you know, where um, I think the first one, the second one, I forgot, you know. But we were pretty high up. <clears throat> but it's really intense. It's really mental. So a lot of guys that think, you know, you got to be tough and big muscle. Absolutely not. Number one, muscle doesn't float. And you need yep. to have fat. I mean, that was a big thing, too. They measure the fat we have on our shoulders to make sure we're going to resist the cold. Right. Because when you swim for six hours, I tell you, not only <sighs> mentally it's really hard, but you start to shivering, and you have to keep uh, thinning, you know. Right. Uh, and I, uh, it's, that was pretty intense. Another thing, you know, in Africa, what they do, they, they take you in a helicopter, and they, again, it's at night. And with a buddy, and uh, you're always tied up with a teammate. And they threw you off at a helicopter. And then you, you're like this, oh, shit. And it's pitch black, and you see a light. They say, okay, I guess that's the way to go. And you go and you <laughs> swim to the light. So How, is, how does this, is this, like, what is the French Foreign Legion? Is, this, is that like the Army version of what you do with the Navy? <clears throat> no, a Foreign Legion is totally different. And okay. I was supposed to go there. My dad said, no, he pulled me out. He said, no, you're going to the Navy. Okay. The Foreign Legion was made, it's a very interesting story, was made to, for um, when, they, when we had the war with, uh, in, um, uh, in Indochine. Yes. So they used to take a prisoner, a prisoner, of, you know, you know, murder, and, and they, they say, you have two choices. Are we going to kill you? Uh, decapitate you, or you're going to join the Legion. Jeez. You're not going to be able to come out, but you're going to join. You have a chance to live a little bit longer. And if you sign, you sign to die. And that's yes. a big thing as a Legionnaire. So you have to change your name. So, And that was the old days. I don't know how it is now. You know, Right. The old days was, was like that. You change your name, and you're going to change your identity. So you're not the same person. Totally different. So like but here, you're gonna, it's like like yep. the prison, like the prison reform, like you have like yep. work release or kind of like reintegrate back to society. That seems like it's yep. like you sign up to give your life for your country, and so I kind of exactly I kind of understand that if you're gonna if you don't yeah no, I I totally I kind of get the understanding of thinking it, it, it makes. But remember, the war was uh, pretty intense. I mean, it's like a Vietnam. A lot of guys, you know, suffer for it. Right. So what they did, instead of uh, letting the prisoner, you know, getting killed or getting, uh, you know, being wasted in, uh, they use it, uh, you know, to uh, to fight, uh, uh, you know, for the French uh, uh, army or right. region. Here. So it belongs to the French, but it's a little bit different. Okay. I was just curious about that. So as yeah, yeah. when you, that, now you start moving into kickboxing, were you able to trade? 
while it's serving your country or is this one of those things where there's like a transition period you're like i gotta figure out what i'm gonna do now yeah it's a no you know it's very interesting they first of all i've been i was choosing chosen to be one of the in a special group of the seals okay there's only one guy from how many thousand i don't know to be in that special group and uh, <clears throat> uh I'm going to stop there because I can't, I can't really yeah, talk no, about perfect, it. But, perfect. So, but what happened after that is, is we trained a little bit, some fighting, absolutely, you know, like some, uh, but not like uh, uh, we were so busy doing so many different things. So one day we are skydiving or parachuting in Africa. The next day we are in the Alps training, skiing in the cold weather. The next day, we are maybe in the south of France or in the Manche doing different uh, rescue mission or uh, taking over boats because we used to do that. That was my specialty, assaulting boats. And uh, so that was really cool. And uh, a story for you, like uh, we have uh, 10 days off, okay, a year. <clears throat> and it was in uh, during the summer. So I was at the beach and... Uh, I was playing with the girls, you know, all that kind of stuff right. because you know, in south of France, I'm having a good time. And then there's a gendarme. The gendarme is kind of the sheriff, you know, the equivalent of the sheriff here. He was waiting in the middle of the beach. And you can see he's in uniform. <laughs> and uh, I'm like this. And I, I look at the guy and he goes like this. He said, oh, hold on, you see my finger? Yep. <laughs> and I said, are you Olivier Gruner? He said, yes, sir. Got to go back to base immediately so we had a, a mission to attend so they took me back to the base and then uh, a couple uh, i think a day later we were all good that night i forgot we were in the middle of the ocean doing some um, uh, assaulting some boats that was pretty wow. cool yeah so i was pretty on that but it's, it's like i said you know a lot of people uh, you know think guys in the armed forces they are you know, they, they, they feel bad for us. But I got to tell you something. I felt like I had a family, a really strong family. Right. Like I brother, knew. Right. Yeah, exactly. And everybody felt that. So when you come out of the armed forces, it's very hard. It's very hard. Because you. I remember going in the grocery store and um, looking at uh, so many different uh, type of soap and the conflicts and uh, you know cereals and then it's so confusing for you because you're right. not used to that you used to have a, no choices this is what you have eat it so there's a lot of stuff that it's it's it's, it's so weird that we are so out of our element when you come out did so you guys tough. did you have like the like here they have the va so like veterans did you guys have that in like france at the time or so you guys no. were like once you serve good luck yeah that was kind of Man, like that. Or, uh, yeah, that was very tough. I mean, that that was the toughest part of. Uh, it took me three years to become normal. Plus, I got captured in Africa. I don't know if you, if I told you that. No. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I was in uh, Djibouti, and we have Arta, where we are based. And with some of my guys, you know, we were inside the canyon, and uh, we got under, whatever, and we spread out. And I went one way; the other guys went the other way. And the next thing I remember, I saw a cliff. And the next thing I remember, I was on the ground bleeding. So I came up, I, I stood up, and uh, guys, uh, you know, people from there just came and uh, came up from the bushes. I mean, you're talking about hundreds of people coming from all over. And it's like, whoa. And it's funny because the way they held me was not hard. It was like, and I remember... It was so soft, like they are friends. So they grabbed my wrist and they wanted to guide me to the village. And then uh, one guy came and another guy, another guy, and then they started to do some stuff. And then I remember this old man talking to them. And I remember a fence and the guy being crouched. He was uh, sitting down, you know, on the, over the fence. Right. And uh, he talked to them. I didn't know what they said. You know, I could not understand what the, the language. And they, I felt my hands were dropping. And then this is where I, I just ran away. Wow. So I didn't know. 
I didn't know how long because I can't, I can't tell you how long. The only way I knew how long it took is one of my teammates came to visit me in Vegas and he told me, do you remember? Because I never talk about it too much. Because it's not because I was screwed up about it because I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed that I was right. Who got Just, a sense of pride kind of takes over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I tried to keep it to myself. But in my mind, it's so weird because I felt that I couldn't count on anybody because when you are there, there's nobody who knew where I was or even if I was captured or not. So you can't count on the cavalry to come to save you. You can't. Right. So anyway, so when I escaped, I remember I went back to the base. I found the base and uh, I was all bleeding. So they took me to the infirmary and we got some stitches in my head right there. And we took pictures and stuff. And it's funny because I was, what, 19 years old? And, and you don't realize it, you know, that you got affected by it because you're young right. and you don't care, you know? And then, but later on in life, it really, like, troubled me a little bit, you know? The fact that, you know, I got captured and, uh, you know, that, did that it could have turned out the wrong way. Right. So did that kind of mental angst kind of help you become a better kickboxer on your quest to be champion? Not really, you know. It's a, it, what really got me a be, to be a better fighter is really the training we had, and I gotta tell you, that's the truth. What they were saying is that if you can't breathe, if you have ex oxygen in your lungs into your bloodstream, you, you can't fight. keep going. Right. You can't keep going. Only the mental would stop you. Yeah. Man. So that's. Yeah, it was. But it's it, guys, you know, I, it, I'm affected, but not affected. You know, I'm a happy guy. So I'm not like, you know, like all screwed up, you know. Right. Um, so I, I'm okay. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of. you, you went in 84, you won the French middleweight kickboxing championship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then two years later, you won the world championship. In between those two years, well, I mean, obviously your quest is to be world champion or the best of whatever you could do. So in those two years, were you kind of just like, like how was your mentality leading into that? You know, I was with a great team. The team, we became world champion, the French team, because we were extremely good at that time. Extremely good. So we had fights left and right. But here's the thing. A lot of fights got canceled. And we used to fight. We were supposed to fight every month. So, and it was really hard on us when they canceled the fight because you train so hard for the fight. And when they cancel it, you have to, you are peaking and then you have to drop down. And 20, 20 days later, you have another fight. So it was like a lot of up. And then right. I did a kind of a, a depression after that. So that was tough. You know, mentally it was really hard. You know, and you'll see like most of the fighters, they will tell you when they stop fighting, it's really hard on them. Very hard on them. Because, you know, right. you have all that, you know, the, 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 the not, not the glory, but the kind of, uh, you know, you... There's that you feel kind of special, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, and the adrenaline pumping constantly, you know. So, what are your it, thoughts it, on fighters like Mike Tyson or like those guys that kind of come out of retirement and want to keep fighting? Like, so is it a? I think it's what you're just trying. You're yeah. saying is that yeah. you have that that fight in your in you that you don't want to give up. The minute you lose that fight, you kind of feel like it was like a mental letdown. So I I yeah. can see that side of it. Yeah. So it's hard, you know, when you. When you get to the top, you know, after the only thing you can do is you're going to lose, you know, you can't, you can't right. go further than that. So it's kind of very hard. So when I, you know, when I did it, you know, after I said, okay, I'm done, I'm going to do something else, you know, and it's, it's not really to be a champ because I think there's always somebody out there can beat you always. Right. It doesn't matter, you know, so, you know, to, to call us a champ, I don't really like that because it's good to have, but it's not, you know, it, it, the mentality for me is a little bit different. I didn't do that because I wanted to be a champ. I right. did that because of the form, because of the martial arts, because of the philosophy behind it. But you get pulled into the competition. Right. That, that mentality just is taken away from us. So now we are... I think, you know, with the UFC and uh, don't get me wrong, I love the UFC. The only thing I have a problem with is uh, it becomes 
uh, how can I say it? I don't like to say trashy, but I don't like people when they trash against each other. It's not a good representation of martial arts. Social media is basically helping people. I mean, I get why they have to sell a fight, but you should know that yeah. you sell the fight on your sure. marriage and your training. Of course. Not the fact that I'm going to kill that guy, I'm going to kill your wife, I'm going to yeah. set yeah. fire to you. It's like, what is that even? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So once you and then you transition again from there into acting, how? So, did, right. So, did I do it? Like I, I, and I'm just like, so you got found at Cades, the film festival, and yep. from there you kind of found your niche doing some really awesome movies. <laughs> well, here's, listen. I think I got. Sometimes you got to be lucky. In life, okay? Right. But you got you to put all your odds on your side. So I was there at the right time at the right place. So it's not because I was so special, but I was there at the right time at the right place. And I did deliver at that time. Right. So it's, and some people, they, they are there at the right time at the right place, but they cannot deliver because they didn't train enough. Right. It doesn't matter if you're a champ or not champ. It doesn't matter. You got to really look good on screen. Okay. So. Um, what happened is I was, as I was hanging out with two guys, uh, an American guy and a Swedish guy. And we were hanging out at the ski resort in Val Torrance and they stay at my house. You know, we used to have, I used to have a condo over there. So we all stayed together and, uh, we were, I was a lift operator. I was a trainer. I was, uh, working at the club. I mean, I had five different jobs. I was doing rescue, you know. <laughs> I mean, when you when you work in the resort, it's a little bit different. So much fun, but you never stop. You do a lot right. of stuff. Yeah. So, and I was hanging out with this guy, and the American guy. You know, you know, the Americans are very clever. They are very, um, how can I say? They know how to sell themselves, and they're really good. Uh, so he looks at me, and his name was Dave. He said, and Dave looks at me, and say, Olivier, let's go to the south of France. You have a house over there. Let's go over there. We're gonna hang out, and we're gonna work for the Cannes Film Festival. I never worked for the Campins Festival. I never did. So we go over there, and Dave is, he was amazing, that guy. He could get a job like that. I mean, so he got us a job. And my job was to control tickets at the theater. You know, you can't come in, you can't get in, you know, you can't get in for the festival. And he was putting posters all over the place. So I made a poster, I had a poster made, you know, a long time ago. And I used his poster and I put it at the entrance. And he told me to do that. I said, what do you want? Because you never know. Maybe somebody is going to see you. He's going to want to put you in the movie. And I was like, all right. So I put it in. <laughs> I didn't expect anything. What was the and picture one of? guy came and he said, who's that guy? I said, that's me. And he looks at me and said, oh. He touched my muscle. Okay, good. He was, uh, uh, he was from India. And he wrote to one of the company, Imperial Entertainment, and he said, I might be, I found a guy for you, you know, to star in your next movie at the Cannes Film Festival. So I met those guys. I went to L.A. And I met those guys and uh, they looked and I did a demonstration, a kickboxing demonstration. I met uh, Eric Carlson, who was a producer and became a director of my oh, two films. And uh, we got along very well. I mean, Eric is an amazing man. Not only a great director, great producer. I really love Eric. I mean, he really, really took care of me. And uh, we start, uh, so he said, okay, I think you'll be okay. So they wrote Angel Town. They choose two writers and we had a kind of a, a conversation with the writers and told them a little bit about my story. Uh, when I got beat up when I was a kid, you know, in high school, because I was skinny, so I got beat up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I was not tough, you know. The but irony. You, up, right. you know, you know, it's funny. I'm sure all the kids, you know, be, beat up. You go home and 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 you cry, but you don't want to cry in front of your parents, and you're so embarrassed. You don't want to cry in front of your, and you don't want to say anything, so you keep everything internal, right? Right. Which right. is not very good, but you know, I didn't want to embarrass myself, you know, telling I got beat up. So I started to learn how to box a little bit. I did. You know, on my own and stuff, karate. But my dad didn't want me to do boxing, so I learned a little bit some Shotokan at the beginning. And then, uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm going backwards. So. 
But anyway, so I studied by Shotokan first, just to let you know. Okay, awesome. You know, so, so that was good. Uh, I had great instructor, excellent instructor, uh, one of the best I ever had. I had um, uh, Dominique Valera. I don't know if you know, is uh, uh, he was a kickboxer, excellent. I mean, amazing guy also. So he was handling the French team. But anyway, so I'm going backwards. So, but anyway, so, uh, but the technique, when he looks at the technique and he looked how I look on the camera, he said, good. So we're going to make the first film. So I signed a five contract with Empion Enter Entertainment, a five deal contract. And then, so we shot the movie. Um, and then when it was over, uh, we had a, a screening at the Rally Studio in Hollywood. And this is will tell me if they do the second one or not. So that was really the test. So it was kind of a, you know, I was like, okay, what am I going to do next if it's not working? You know, I didn't it's really a great know. Movie. My dream was to maybe movie. open a gym, you know. Right. So anyway, <clears throat> they invited 40 Danish people because the investor were Danish. So at the Raleigh studio, I remember... I had a girlfriend and uh, we went there and she was sitting with me and I, we were watching the premiere. I never seen the film. So that was the first time. And in the middle of the show, we were sitting and I felt this on my shoulder. And I turn around and I look and I didn't know who he was. And he said, we'll have a meeting after this. Okay. And it was midnight when the film was over, so it's pretty late. And Lind, the, the girl was with me, looked at me and said, do you know who that is? I said, no, I don't know. That's Jacques Gilardi. Jacques oh. Gilardi from ICN. And I said, okay. <laughs> I don't know who he is. You know, so, and right. I'm still new in the entertainment, so I have no clue. right? So I had a meeting with Jack, right? And this, at this point, I knew I would keep doing films. So the difficult part after was to wait for the next film. So Angel Town came out in the theater, did extremely well. We, we, we had the best screen average uh, at that time. So it was in uh, Westwood, Hollywood, all over the place. I went to New York for the premiere. And I, I remember I used to sneak in into the, the theater, pay for my seat, right? And then I tried to listen to, you know, to make sure that, you know, if they liked it or not, because I still, you know, you become very insecure at this point. Right. right? Because you don't know. And then uh, I remember I was in New York and uh, this guy sit down and uh, there's another guy who came in a little bit late and said, so how is it? It's good. It's good. Just sit down. Sit down. It's good. It's good. At this point, you know, I knew it, it was good. So Angel Town did extremely well for me. And watching your movies, like... <laughs> Like, now I get why. It seems like every time you were holding a gun or there was, like, how it was filmed, it was very believable. And I think, obviously, that's a testament towards your actual background. Yeah. So yeah. it kind of helps sell the movie. Because you see some movies, even now, where you're just kind of like, that's not a believable action star. That guy's probably never held a gun before. Yeah, or, yeah. Let alone been a, a team leader. So it's, it's been kind of cool. Yeah. So here's the thing. For me, this is very important that, and even when we choreograph the fight, it's very hard. It's not easy. It's still not easy to find the right stunt guy because you have to understand about stunts. They go from one job to another one. So for them, it's their career, which means if we hurt them, they cannot work. Right. So it's kind of a very tricky job. And, you know, when you punch somebody, of course, you don't punch him in the face, but they're really selling your punch. So if somebody does just at this, you know, a little movement like this, means that your punch is not strong enough. Now, if somebody goes like this, boom, and get knocked out, you know, that makes a difference. Right. So the stunt really sell your power. So, so it's interesting, you know. You've worked with, I mean, Donald the Dragon, Wilson, Cynthia Rothrock, yeah. Mark Dacostas, Martias Hughes. Like, you've worked with... Oh, legit, legit professional world champion class athletes. Yeah, so that, that must be fun for you, too, to kind of see where you're at, especially now. I think the last one you did was uh, the one I saw, Showdown Vanilla. 
and it was yeah. just yeah, stacked yeah. with like all these incredible martial artists, and, yeah. and so it's kind of cool seeing you guys yeah. all interact like that. Well, you know, to be honest with you, we are we became friends, and the beauty with this business, especially at our age, there's no ego. Which is there's awesome. no ego. It was awesome. I mean, Don Wilson and me, we laugh constantly. <laughs> there's no like, there's no ego. We don't talk about oh, I was better than. We don't care. He's a great guy. I know. I know. Don is an awesome fighter. Oh, trust me. He's and when he punch, he really punches hard. I mean, one punch, man. You say bye bye. So there's no ego. You know, we don't. We don't. We don't show the muscles. We're not just. We're just humble to each other, and we enjoy each other and our company. Even with Cynthia, is the same thing. We are very. Um, we became friends, you know, and that's really it. It, it became so. It, it, it became so different that what it used to be in the '90s when there was a lot of the, uh, you know, people challenging. Right. And, uh, Who's got the bigger? That was uh, that was tough. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why you? Why not me? And you are like, I'm not fighting with you. No, I'm not. I'm not. You know, I'm just. Right. <laughs> I, I'm not into that. You know, just chill. You know. Um, but we can friends, and uh, we try to do the best we can, you know, and help each other, and uh, it, it's really cool to work with guys like that. Yeah, and yeah. you've actually kind of transitioned to do a lot of directing now too. And so, what are your goals with that? So, I think especially what's going on right now in the world, you know, we really need to get rid of our egos because we don't realize that maybe I'm okay, you know, I'm fine. But other people are not, you know. And for me to show my success, bring people down. And I don't like that. I really feel bad. And that's why I don't show, you know, if I have a Ferrari, if I have a big house. I think it's totally inappropriate to make other people jealous. Right. I can't. I, I prefer to, to tell them, listen, the best road is like the Rocky. When you're the Rocky, the, uh, you know, the Rocky. When the Rocky, when he's at the bottom. And he climbs up. That's why. That's where you want to be. This is the most exciting. When you're on top, it's kind of boring. So I want to make sure that the audience knows one thing is is uh, um, life is never perfect. And when people tell you that they have their beep shit together. Yeah. They're, it's, they're insecure. <laughs> just, yeah. They don't have it. Trust me. And I work with a the richest guys in the world. I was on the 747, do security for these guys. And trust me, they're great people. Don't get me wrong. But everybody has his own problem. So don't think it's perfect, you know. And nobody has it perfectly. You know? And that's, that's really important to me. Just So in terms of directing and showing different shows, there's some messages that I want to send out there. And I want to send... To the people, like if you, they look at themselves, like being in a movie, being the star of their own film, and not feel bad about themselves, even if they are at the bottom of the hill, it's okay, because you can go up, and that's right. really important. You can go up. Just be disciplined. Make sure you don't do drugs. And I know it's stupid to say that now, but I'm just telling you, there's something that you have to understand. Uh, in the Navy, when they taught us. If you don't appreciate a glass of water, it's because you're not thirsty enough. But the day, the day you're thirsty, oh my God, that, it's that the best glass water. of water is going to be <laughs> worse. More, You have a million dollars and a glass of water, you're going to take that glass of water. Right. So if you are at the bottom, you have nothing to lose. Just be disciplined and trust me, if you do the right thing, good things are going to happen to you. I promise you. That's but a great, tough when you're, great mindset. Yeah, when you're, you know, when you're at the bottom, it's not easy. You know, you think you have, you're a failure. Like people look at you that you're a failure. Maybe people are sleeping in their cars and they feel so bad because they don't know if a cop is going to lock on the door and say, hey, you can't park here. Right. You know, people are living in their cars right now. People don't have any money to eat them, to eat. And you see stars, you know, uh, flashing their gold Rolex and their Ferrari. Like, right. Come on, man. Just don't do that. Don't put people down. It's not cool. But inspire them, you know. I, I agree 100%. Those are right. awesome words. Yeah. And I'm not perfect. Don't I'm, you know, I'm not perfect. <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> no, <before>. it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. let's kind of talk about 
Gruner Tactical and yeah. kind of what you're doing. How do people join up with you for that? Where do you train? What are some stuff you kind of go over? Your social media on that, some of like the uh, kind of like the transition from primary to secondary or kind yes. of like the throws or like the dive strikes or when you click someone up, like all that stuff is so awesome. So yeah. how does someone kind of reach out to you and get that training? Yeah. So here's the thing right now. So I talked to my, because we're a good friend with my ex-wife, right? Right. So I talked to her and I said, you know, I tell her my feelings. Uh, I tell her, you know what? I feel bad by putting this out there because I don't want somebody to look at it and learn from me and put it out there, you know, and creating uh, some, uh, you know, going on the wrong side of the law, you know. And that's why it's, it's very hard for me. So to, uh, how can I say, to put it out there for everybody to see it. Well, it's one of those things where a, te a teacher is always, you could be the master or whatever, and you're teaching someone, it's up to that individual to choose what they're going to do with that. And so it's definitely what you're doing with the tactical, the knife, the gunplay, and the yep. the the learning of the weapon. There, there's definitely something there this day and age where everyone's kind of gun shy or I don't want to trade the next uh, school shooter. So I, yeah. I, I totally sympathize with what you're saying. Yeah. But I have some really good information because my information that I get is not from, uh, you know, from uh, – uh, from the internet is really from experience, you know, like I, uh, <clears throat> um, I did, obviously, you know, I've done some executive protection and we have to carry guns, you know, uh, and then I, I picture some, uh, situation that happened to me in the Navy and the thing that we, the reality of things, you know, sometimes you can get shot at, right. And you don't know where the gun or the, the, the shots are coming from. A lot of guys in the film, you see, bing, okay, it's coming from this. That's not the truth. <laughs> Sometimes you got to figure out where it's coming from. Sometimes you're going to get hit. You're going to see blood dripping out of your legs. You don't even know that you're bleeding. You'll find out later on because something is dripping and you don't know what it is. And you look at, oh, oh I'm bleeding, you know, and you find out you were getting shot and you don't know. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of information like that that, uh, you know, could have helped. Also, what I like to do is the medical behind it. I love that. Because you have the, uh, first of all, just to let you know, if you do executive protection and you have to pull up your gun out, you you screw it up somehow. Yeah. Definitely. The advance yeah. was not done right. The uh, You didn't pick up the signs. And these signs that the body will tell you, said, this is the wrong place. I don't know. I can't pinpoint it, but this is not a good place. There's something wrong. So maybe there's people out there that give you information that you don't even know, you know. Maybe there's spirits or maybe there's signs that you see, but you can't really see it. Right. So, But you got to really listen to your guts. And that saved me a few times, you know. Um, uh, what else? Tactical. You know, a lot of people, they are really good shooters. But when you put them in a situation, they're going to screw up. If it's because dark or if there's the, water everywhere or there's screaming or other gunshots or grenades. Screaming, like, right. smoke, right? Screaming smoke. Because when you shoot like, um, let's say, 100 or 200 rounds, you start to have smoke around you. Um, you can't you can be in the dark. So I love, I love training in the dark, pitch black. Uh, I love training with no red dots. And the reason is because maybe you're not going to have your gun on you. Maybe you're going to have to pick up a gun. Right. And that gun is not, you know, it's not, uh, your eyesight is different. You know, you got to learn from the, uh, having uh, the right side and the left side, you know, the red eye, the right eye also to be able to shoot the, you know, left and right for cleaning the room. Um, knowing about uh, camouflage, even if they're in your building, you know, if you are, if you know that somebody is inside your home and you say, how do I'm going to ambush a guy? You know, a bad dude. There's a lot of stuff you can't do, you know. And you got to know about how to camouflage yourself. And sometimes there's nothing in front of you. You can't be in the dark. You right. can be inside the, the bedroom, door open, lit the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the different rooms in front of you, uh, in front of it. So it's going to be lit in. You're going to see the guy coming. He's not going to be able to see you, you know. And uh, 
as a sniper, you know, you shoot one and you have to move. You can right. stay. So there's a lot of information out there. It's not as easy as we think. You right. Know, practical is really, really a different, uh, different level. You can, we do this also. Um, we funnel people into the kill zone. So example, we put a desk in different uh, position. So the people we know, they don't have time to move the desk. If right. they do move the desk, you're going to hear. So we funnel them into, into the kill zone. So things like that, you know, we call it that tactical. Right. It's cool the car. Too. Yeah. The, the, the articulation for the, your actions is something that a lot of people don't really understand either, where you're kind of like, you might have all this training, but there's a wrong time to use that training. And if you get yourself killed or if you're doing security work, your clients or some of your teammates get hurt or killed as well. Absolutely. So we have, I have so much information, a lot of information. Um, and the only thing I can say is uh, what I did in the past and to tell you how meticulous we have to be. And uh, we were doing something in Europe and uh, we were going to a hot in a hotel and the hotel and an exit, um, a special exit in case of things were going wrong. So we check it out and it was 8 p.m. in the evening. So I checked it out. I went there and I physically opened the door. Good. We did some stuff and we came back. It was one o'clock in the morning. And everybody went to bed. I said, no, 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 guys, I'm not going to go to bed. I want to check that exit. No, we already checked. I'm going to check. I went there and there's a big chain around it. Jeez. So things like that, we when you do security, it's not as as simple as we think. It's very hard, especially nowadays. You got to be extremely right. A lot of people think it's just all war shows and parties and mansions and private yeah. jets. It's like you you might have to walk down no, no. that hallway for ten straight hours and you don't know what door is going to open up, what elevator is going to. So there's a fire. Exactly. So it's, it's great. I, I would love, I think, so how does someone kind of reach out to your, do they go to your website or how do they kind of just reach out to you about well, that? Yeah, well, right now it's, I'm on Facebook a lot, but I'm going to pull my website. Uh, I'm going to post it pretty soon. Awesome. Um, I didn't do it yet because of that reason I was talking to you about it. Right. So I got to be very careful how I do things. Uh, but there's a way of uh, getting in. You will be right. able to get in with all the information I need because I don't want this to go to the wrong hand. No, I, that would yeah. feel so bad. Right. Right. Side NDAs and all that. Exactly. And it's, it's, I know it's a pain in the butt, but you know, I, I really believe it's, it's, it's really important, especially in our days. Um, <clears throat> a, a lot of things too, that I, I made a backpack. I don't know if you know that it's called the loan operator backpack. Really? Uh, yeah. And it's bulletproof. And uh, it looks like a civilian by backpack, so you carry it like normally. I think I have it here. Put your laptop and, in uh, there, your sunglasses. Yeah, and I have. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this is it. Can you see it? Yeah. All right. So um, this was made for originally for a medical medic bag. So hold on. Bear with me. Bear with me. So when you open it, when you open it, it looks like this, right? Okay. So here you can put some uh, bags. So I'm going to put one bag and you'll see as Velcro. And I'll show you the concept of it. <clears throat> so if you have those little plastic bags, you know, little patches, you stack in there. That's it. So here you can have your medical, you can have your... Um, uh, whatever you need, you know, in the backpack, whatever you need. But you can organize it with those backpack. You have three, it comes with it. And I have stick, and that's the best thing. Oh, no. <clears throat> As a stick hidden in the back. Oh, so like that. here, the stick, you come out and you can fight. And I went through every airport and I passed it because it looks like the frame. Right. Um, so let's see if it's here. No, it's over there. Okay. And then inside, so this is bulletproof. So watch this. So example, you know, there's a lot, right? So this is what we do. Right. Right. So if somebody 
I have the backpack and somebody comes, you know, with a machete. Instead of putting up your gun and shooting at the guy, I just pull and this become a shield and I can stop it, right? Not only I stop it and then I can take the, st the stick or I can kick him or I can do a lot of stuff with my backpack, right? Um, wow. There's, there's a lot of options in this. I mean, there's so many different options. We have things handles here for the kids. So if you have kids, it's good to have your hands free. Yeah. And this is for executive protection. You know, when we do executive protection and we are, we are overseas and sometimes you cannot carry your own guns, right. you know, because of the laws. So you got to figure out, you know, how can I, you know, protect my, you know, the person, you know, that I'm protecting. So if you go to China, it's going right. to be different. You know, if you go to Europe, I can carry. So it's different. But if you go to China, it's different, you know. Um, so you need to have some tools and you need to train constantly. Yeah, training nonstop. So yeah. something really, yeah, nonstop. So here's the thing. And we did that with the Israeli, you know. Uh, I don't know if you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure you know Jacob yeah. Wrestler. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, know him. But really great guy. And um, we talk a lot and we train a lot. And he's a very smart, very clever guy, you know. And we figured it out. If somebody come up right now with a gun on my head, and I'm trained, right? Right. And if I train every day, I would not have the reflex to go bump, bump, bump. Because it's a part of my training. I would be... If I didn't train for a month, I would see it again. I said, is that real? Is it not real? What? And that's too late for me. Right. And then I'm going to freeze. It doesn't matter who I am. Maybe I will do something. But most of the time, if you train every day, you see something coming, you're going to react from it because it's kind of part of the training. Right. This so is this that, is what... Yeah, that makes sense. Sec that's secondary nature of just yeah. reacting and adapting to the situation. Good. I have another tool that I want to show you that I bought. It's, it's Can people buy that book bag? How do you, Mark? That's a great, uh, that's cool. Awesome. Yeah, he's going to be, uh, I'm going to put it on the website. Okay, good. Sale and, good. So, I have a guy, it's made in America. So everything is, you know, I want to keep it in the U.S., obviously. You know, I, <clears throat> you know, I bought this also. So this is very expensive, but you can, this is called a SIM. You okay. You shoot in it. So, and we go full power in it. So when oh, we do awesome. Yeah, we, we put it on. It's hard to breathe, so you got to be trained. So that's why I wear it sometimes, you know, in the heat and and try to. There you go. So then you can punch, and I don't feel anything. You know? Right. So the good thing with this is, like, when we do our training, we do uh, with high-end guys. I'm not talking about beginners. Right. But even then, if I really want to see the reality, I want them to feel how it's going to be if somebody's going to attack you with a knife. Right. It's not going to be, it's going to be extremely violent and you're going to react like that. So I'm going to give you an example. Like uh, uh, I was thinking about it. Say, like today, example, I, uh, uh, I got a job, you know, and they're going to pay me, let's say, a million dollars a year. I'm so happy, right? I'm content. I'm in, in good mood. And then somebody comes in with a knife and he starts to threaten me. My reaction would be what? Do you think I'm going to go towards the knife and try to do my ching chang chong move? No. I would say, dude, the, it's a good day for me. I don't want it. Okay, you go on. Here is my wallet. Okay, you got it. I'm moving. So that's one of the my mindset at that time. Now picture this now. Same guy. And then uh, he's gone into a fight with a friend of his. Or maybe, you know, he got fired. Now, my mindset is different. And then somebody comes up with a knife, I'm going to attack. Right. So the interesting things about this is in a real street fight situation, you're not going to react all the time the same way. So you're going to train for it. But can you train 24-7? No. So sometimes if you have to walk, Walk away from it and not be a hero. That's okay, right? Right. Because maybe your mom is not there, and sometimes you're going to be very aggressive because you have a lot of anger inside of you and you have to take it out. Right. So sometimes things change a lot, you know. So that's why you need to do a lot of meditation, a lot of training comes with it, you know. Which is I crazy. 
I love that you're so reality based in your training. I you you get to okay. all these you, a lot of these people host these classes or courses, and it's just like, all right, here's the target with the pistol at 15 yards. We'll do the MP5 at 25, and then we'll do the uh, Remington at whatever 50 yards. It will go yep. down there. But you add water, fire, smoke, screaming. Like I love that you're focusing on the reality base because, in all honesty, that's only that's what's going to happen. You're gonna you right? need to go through that. Exactly. You're not so going to have a paper target. Exactly. So I put them in the worst uh, case scenario. So you're going to have, maybe at the beginning, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make them clear the room. I want to see what they do. And then we can correct that. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to change things around. I'm going to put the smoke. And this is going to change. And then I'm going to shut down the light. And the smoke is going to be still there. And then I'm going to put noise. And then That's we're going to awesome. have smoke. No vision. How are you going to deal with that? And I got to tell you what I do also with the guys, you know, when I go to their home, if I do, uh, if they want to learn some, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, to be yeah, uh, right. uh, some self-defense, all that kind of stuff. So what I do is say, I talk to them and say, okay, now I'm going to blind you. And I want you to take me to your room. And you're going to discover things that you never discovered before. So he's going to be like this. He's going to touch it. Okay, second stairs. Or maybe it's over here. Oh, no. I forgot. Is my door open inwards or do you have to push? That makes a big difference. Right. Yeah, for barricading yourself too, for sure. Absolutely. Not only that, but watch this. If I want to clear the room, clear it oh, visually. Oh, you got to, right. If you open it and you open it like this. <laughs> it will be shot. The bad guy is going to see it. That you're opening so you gotta you gotta change if you push it's gonna be different it's gonna be the opposite so there's a lot of stuff that you have to learn especially when you do cut the pie you know right uh, there's a lot of information even in your own uh, house that you don't even know so what i do is i put them in their bed and say okay now you hear a noise and he gets up and he goes he gets a gun say blah 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 this is not reality go back <laughs> yeah right you hear a noise right the first thing you're gonna do is what you're going to say, did I hear this? Was it a dream? Is it real? And then you're going to hear a second noise. I said, yeah. So we are talking about time now. How long will it take for you to get to your gun if right. somebody comes to your home? Are you willing to shoot somebody too if he's in your home? Right. You know? Would you? Um, is it worth it? You know, you got to you got to think about a lot. Right. Really, Think about all that stuff, you know. Um, if you have kids, obviously, there's no doubt. Especially yeah. female. They don't care. That they're going to protect their, their, their kids. Even the father, you know, is going to protect their family. That's for sure. But again, you put them in a real situation and you tell them, now I want to see how you pick up your gun. And then you'll figure it out. Those guys, you go over there, shit, where did I put my keys? Where are my keys? Oh, hey, honey, yeah. where are my keys? Right. Think that happened. And then you open it, and then suddenly you realize that, okay, I got the gun. Oh, where's the, where's the magazine? Where did you put it? Things like that happen. So, and it happens in a worse time, you know. And, and so things like that, I really want to make sure that people understand that when people say, oh, I, I like to have guns, but I get guaranteed the time you're going to need your gun, you're not going to have it. Right. So then what's your next step? So what I do also is I make them listen to the, some sound of shooting. And they have to tell me, is it a 9 millimeter? Is it a 22? Is it a 5.56 or 7.62? Makes a big difference. Right. If it's a 22 and I have a Hummer, you know, a pretty big car, even a, 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 a decent big, you know, a big car with big doors, maybe the round is not going to go through. So maybe if you use the door as cover, not as conceal, as cover, maybe that's going to stop this, uh, the, the 22. But now if it's a, a 9 millimeter or if it's a 7.63, it's going to go through it. So if you're in right. your house and you're in behind the, the door or behind the wall, if the guy is 7.63, it's going to go through the wall. So you got to be aware of that. You know, so... What's cool about you is that you're, you seem like you're always learning too. Like you could be a teacher, but you're only going to be a better teacher if you keep learning yourself. And that's what's really cool to hear you talk. 
I learn and I'm passionate about it. You know, I, I no, love you to are right. from people, right? I want to know. And, and, you know, when I fly helicopters, when I talk to pilots, I don't tell them what is the best thing you've done. I want to say, I, I asked them, said, I want to know where did you screw up? Because I'm sure I'm going to do it. So I want right. to know. Okay, so, so that that was actually my last question because I read that I'm like this can't be this can't be a, this has to be a typo. So, how long have you been doing or flying helicopters, and how do you using your background training mentality for stuff? How do you trade for emergencies? Like, what is some of your if you can explain it? Like, yep. how do you simulate helicopter issues so you could kind of encounter? Yeah. So first of all, to me in the helicopter. So I made a lot of mistakes, you know, I learned from my mistakes. Uh, I had uh, to land, I did a few emergency landings, uh, one between Boston and Vegas. I had to land on a, on a side road. Uh, I had uh, I cut the tail of the helicopter. It was not my fault, but it still cut the tail. Um, I did, you know, a lot of things happened in a helicopter. So my point, which is great about when you're flying, it's like the training. You got to be on top of your game. Right. That, But you cannot count on anyone and you cannot count on on thinking that the engine is going to be running no matter what. You can't right. it at any time. Bad fuel. You can have uh, maybe one of the, <clears throat> of the, the turbine is going to have an issue, you know. Uh, I got a lot of people who died that I know that I flew with, you know, at least 10 people. Wow. So you be careful, you know, when you fly a helicopter. It's no joke. So what we do is when we do the pre-flight, we really do a very good pre-flight or we try to. So if I'm tired, the good thing is I get along with my partner, pilot. If I'm tired and I do, I felt like, you know, I did something wrong. I didn't check something particular that I'm kind of worried about it. I can call him and say, can you check it for me? And he will do it. So we are really working as a team. But we don't miss any steps. Because not only you can hurt yourself, but you can hurt others on the ground. And that's really, really kind of uh, something that you have to think about it, you know. Right. It's, um, yeah. Go ahead. No, I remember years ago, I took training to simulate a, uh, like a Marine one because I was in the Secret Service. And so oh, cool. we, simu we simulate like a helicopter crash, submerged yeah. underwater, but you would do it where it's like, okay, take my seatbelt off, get out. But if you're underwater and you're upside down, you don't have goggles. So now you're kind of like, and it all goes back to what you're saying. Like this training, I God forbid I'd never have to experience that, not <laughs> even in real life. But you're like, to, trip, to simulate and trade real life situations that can happen is the most, it's kind of, it's so rewarding too, to say, you, hey, if this does happen, I might actually be able to be pretty good at this. Yeah, and not only that, but that's a great uh, great uh, thing that you, so you're mentioning. And that's what I'm mentioning in the seminar I did. It's like, uh, you know, when they, they do the knife attack, they right. said, well, there's no other way they're going to do it. They're going to grab your shirt and they're going right. to stab you, stab right? You, right? With usually they do. So what I did is said, let's do this. And you know what? You're going to see the mistake you're making, but do it now. Because right. when you're at, you know, you know, you already experienced it. One, you know, you can be okay. You right. know, it's possible for you to get out of this. So same thing for what you did. It's great that they are doing that. Yeah. They used to uh, dump us into the pool and turn it and you have goggles and stuff. You can't see anything and you have to, and do your buckles and try to figure out your way out. It's not easy. No, it's not. Especially if you have a protectee with you and then you oh, have yeah. teammates and you're just kind of like, man, there is like, it all goes back. You say everyone thinks security and all that stuff is, oh, it's great. But I mean, well, the days are bad. They're bad. And you can't, your training comes into play. You just can't, yeah. you can't have a bad day when that doesn't become a bad day. That's true. But there's something also very interesting about the training. And that's why I want to mention uh, um, I think the issue that we have when people are pulling their gun too easy is because they're not trained enough. So that's my philosophy. I think, you know, if I see a guy over there with a knife, and this, this is me, okay? I'm not, I'm not I don't want right. to mention anything, but if I see somebody in a knife 
And I know I've been training for a long time. Would I pull up my gun and start shooting? Maybe yeah. not. Right. Because what I'm trying to say, I can't manage it. Maybe I'm going to put my car between him and me. I don't have to shoot him yet, you know. But I understand what people are going through, you know. But again, you know, there's the training thing is so important. And I think sometimes uh, some people in security industry, they don't train enough. I know they are busy, but they should train every single day at a pretty uh, high level. I was, uh, I was talking with Keith Cook last night. I think you guys know each other. And yeah. we we're talking about how very pro, we're both very pro Second Amendment, right to bear arms. But just because you have that right doesn't mean you should just be allowed to go get a gun without the training. Because if anyone can pull a trigger. It's, yeah. it's the people that can't articulate why they're not pulling it or need to pull it. There's where the lies of the issue. It was just kind of cool hearing you kind of piggyback off that with yeah. the idea that you still need to trade with your, your gun. You still need to yeah. trade with all your tools. All your tools. And then make sure you're very efficient because then you have a certain security you have to build in yourself. And that's really, I think it's really important. If you're insecure and scared, I understand. It's like a dog. When he's scared because there's a bigger dog, he's, he's going to attack and, and bark first, right? Right. Same thing, you know, but if you, if you, if you know, you can handle it, you know, like uh, uh, I've been in street fights, you know, in Europe a lot, you know, because it's a little bit different than here. Who um, is? Much. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> comfortable at the end, it's like, we were not scared. You know, guys start to yell at us and say, Hey dude, you know, you really want this, you know? And then we knew how to handle it, you know, because we had this training behind us. So I think the training, it's not only, to be good at it, but just also to have a self-confidence so you don't have to freak out and just get to uh, a situation where you have a, a deadly right. uh, effect on, 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 on the, right. at the end of the day. So, but I don't want to criticize anything, but it's easy to play quarterback. It is. You know, when you're not there, you so I'm not referring to anything. I'm just referring to myself. Right. You know? So that's why I think, you know, if uh, somebody comes with a knife and uh, I have my backpack, I'd be like, actually it happened on, uh, in uh, Starbucks. You know, I was sitting down and uh, there's a guy who was nuts and he started to pull something and uh, people freak out. I said, so oh, yeah, I know. how come you're not freaking out? I said, it's okay. I got my bag. It's okay. I'm okay. Don't worry about it. And the guy was just freaking out and after right. he left, and I was it, but again, it could have been, it, it could have turned out, you know, extremely bad, you know. So right. I think training would lead to a better outcome. That's my feeling. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for this. This was what an awesome talk. And as soon as COVID kind of clears up, I'm gonna head your way. Yeah. I, I love that what you're doing out there, and I, whatever we could do to help, kind of push out anything for you, it's it's awesome. And come and train, you know, especially around the car. I got some different I, techniques. I love that. Because you always get clients in and out. And you just. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're going to love this. Because we do we do stuff that, you know, like when, when you shoot uh, uh, and you use a car as a covered kind of, there's a way of doing things. And now we want speed. So I'll show you a couple techniques like maybe you know or maybe you don't. But it's great to exchange information. And it's and, the training and the knowledge. Yeah. You and we try it. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, we'll stay in touch. And then uh, yep. thank you. Thank you. Aloha.